a little bit quicker through some of this because Dr. Reeder covered a lot of it. And like Dr. Thompson, I'm going to start my timer. Here we go. So um, differential diagnosis, anatomy, symptoms, physical exam, tests, treatment. Um, this picture of Pittsburgh where I trained. So the, um, you know, differential diagnosis involves the anatomy, right? So we've had a good discussion um, so far on differential diagnosis of the hip. It's much like the shoulder and everybody that was here this morning, it's like that, you know, little red truck that got driven over by the, you know, the big huge dump truck. There's so many structures around the hip like the shoulder. It's kind of interesting and intriguing because there's so many things, but you can start to dial it um, or get your algorithm going certain directions like Dr. Fowler mentioned based on their history and um, the physical exam. So remember the bones, muscle, nerves, bursa, and non-musculoskeletal issues. So here's a little bit of a differential diagnosis and I made this kind of busy on purpose uh, because there's a lot of structures to think about. And there's a lot of issues on who your patient is, who they are, how old they are, what type of activity they have, um, whether they come with an MRI, uh, like Dr. Reeder mentioned, of uh, a 73-year-old with a labral tear, um, you know, whether that's symptomatic. They may have no anterior groin pain at all. They point laterally because um, they've got trochanteric bursitis. So keep all that, you know, everything is not just in a vacuum. You have to put the whole thing together, patient age, activity level, physical exam, history, imaging studies, and, uh, you know, you'll kind of stay on the right track. So um, some history, is it traumatic? Is it insidious? Some of the traumatic, um, particularly FAI symptomatic patients are um, athletes that um, you know, classically a football player that goes up for a catch and gets hit and falls down, you know, and it has a traumatic um, a split type landing episode and injures his hip. You know, I've seen that and it's resulted in uh, labral tears, chondral defects of the hip, um, subluxations of the hip, dislocations of the hip um, that need to be reduced. All of those are traumatic. Those are younger patients. Um, insidious onset. This is the 40-year-old um, female who states that um, she just had her second child. She is started an exercise program to lose the baby weight and now she's starting to have groin pain and now she can't sleep and now she can't sit in a car for more than 10 minutes and she describes that classic C sign we've heard a couple times. Um, that's insidious onset and it gets worse. So symptoms worse with activity and sitting. Um, patients will say, well, it used to bother me when I, when I ran 10 miles or seven miles or five miles or two miles. Now I don't run anymore. Now I can't walk for exercise anymore. And now I can't even sit or sleep anymore. And that's the progression of FAI, femoral tabular impingement, labral tears. And that's what patients will tell you from the history. So just spending two or three or five minutes with a patient, you can kind of get a sense of, of um, where they're going with this. Um, hip flexion is uncomfortable. Rising from a seated position, and they'll describe catching sometimes. Difficulties with stairs, shoes, socks, and putting on hose. S same exact complaints that patients will have that have hip arthritis, but you get good x-rays like we've seen, and they don't have hip arthritis. So some of the anatomy, you've seen that ad nauseum. Uh, central compartment, this is something that's unique that they didn't mention. So the central compartment we think of, you might hear, that's the acetabulum, the socket, the femoral head, and the labrum. I tell patients the labrum is like a gasket. It keeps all the, you know, the ar ar articular fluid kind of in and bathing the articular cartilage, which is where the nutrition comes from, right? So if you break off a piece of cartilage, um, the cartilage can still get its nutrition from the synovial fluid. So small cartilage pieces can, bec can become bigger loose body pieces without even being connected. Some patients don't realize that either. So the peripheral compartment is outside the central compartment, the femoral head and neck region, and then extra-articular, the iliopsoas tendon, some of the uh, extra-articular bursa that we, we heard about. So um, it's more of the anatomy, um, you know, the femoral head, central compartment, the cartilage, we all, you know, saw a lot of that in the last couple talks. I'm going to skip through this. Bursa. So physical exam, what's their gait pattern? Um, are they walking normally? Do they have a Trendelenburg gait? A lady, so I, you know, I do a lot of um, sports medicine and arthroscopy. So hip arthroscopy, shoulder arthroscopy, knee arthroscopy. So someone says I have hip pain and they see me and they, they walk in and the, the lady just this week is walking like this. And I ask her, well, can you just do this? No, she can't. She falls down. So she's got a lumbar issue with weak abductors and a Trendelenburg gait. 
It's not a hip problem. So again, you have to sort it into what, what they are and watch their gait pattern. What's their range of motion compared to both sides, just like the shoulder? Um, what's their strength? Log rolling. If you just log roll their hip, had another lady, 72-year-old um, lady, she fell. She went to the urgent care. X-rays were negative. She came in. She couldn't bear weight. And you do a simple log roll, and she was in terrible amount of pain. Got an MRI. She has a greater trochanteric fracture. Okay, so some of these little things, if something just log rolling hurts, it's something more significant. You need to find out what it is. And just because x-rays are negative doesn't mean they don't have a hip fracture, particularly if it's an elderly person um, that has um, an insidious fall, not a whole lot of trauma. So direct trauma patient, where does it hurt? A lot of hip impingement doesn't hurt when you push places. So if they have um, um, enthesitis at the ASIS, that hurts when you push on it, it's above the hip. If they have um, flex, hip flexor tendonitis, that hurts when you push on it. You can push all over the place when someone that has hip impingement, they really don't hurt that often. It's the, you know, the HIT exam, the uh, hip impingement test. So flexion, adduction, internal rotation. So sports hernia, um, you know, that's a, a, a big crossover in terms of symptoms. You know, real easy, sports hernia, if they have a valsalva maneuver, you ask them to do a half of a crunch and it hurts and they're tender, you know, in the canal, think of a sports hernia, especially if everything else is kind of negative. Um, we talked about piriformis syndrome. So localization, where is it? Where's the pain? Re uh, really, I can't stress that enough. My hip hurts, that happens all the time, it's back here. Or my hip hurts out here or it's right here. Now we're talking about the hip, the groin. Well, it's not my groin, it's my hip. It's, it's amazing people don't know where their hip are, as was said earlier. So C sign, rule out lateral trochanteric bursitis. Posterior pain, like has stated, been stated before, rarely intraarticular, but it can be. And you know, an intraarticular injection um, can help sometimes. So there's the C sign. We saw this already. Most commonly is mixed. So you get a combination of pincer and cam. So many are mixed like this. Labral tear picture there. This is the hip impingement test. So hip flexion, adduction, and then internal rotation. And people will typically with hip impingement and a labral tear, that will make them almost jump off the bed. So pretty dramatic exam. And um, just anecdotally, when you externally rotate, so you check external rotation, internal rotation, then adduct and internal rotation. If you do external rotation and people have trochanteric problems, they'll have pain laterally, uniformly. And you'll do this, and they won't have any pain at all. And those are the people with trochanteric problems. Um, so diagnostic x-rays, we saw these a lot. Compared to the contralateral side, AP pelvis, so you can see both hips. Is that normal narrowing or not? Well, compared to the other side. So that's why you get an AP pelvis. Um, frog lateral. Uh, you know, we me measure alpha angles like Dr. Reeder showed on the MRI. So, you know, here's, here's an important thing to see. And I put this up here because, you know, this isn't quite normal. Maybe they were having, you know, this hip pain. Well, that's not normal because I can tell that it's different from here, right? Um, and then they've got arthritis of their lumbar spine too. So a, hip, uh, a pelvis x-ray can tell you a lot. You know, SI joints, symphysis, lumbar spine, hip compared, hip side to side. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of information we can get from it. So here's some more um, diagnostic um, x-rays and MR arthrograms, cam impingement, cam impingement, alpha angle. This alpha angle is almost 90 degrees. Look at it. this, all this bone outside this concentric circle. That's where the um, cam impingement starts right here. Um, this is a good CT scan. This person has a subchondral cyst. Okay, this is all, so if you put a concentric circle around here, this is all cam impingement. This abuts here, the labrum gets caught in the middle, gets torn, and you get, I tell people, these cysts um, and like cysts and other joints are like potholes. You get a little crack in the cartilage or a crack in the bone, synovial fluid gets in there, there's a reaction, there's a breakdown product, bone gets resorbed, and it's just like a pothole, and it will slowly get bigger and bigger and bigger. So we see these at the time of arthroscopy because we take this bone off and we dive right into these cysts. So MR arthrography, greater sensitivity, as Dr. Reeder mentioned. Um, this is important. Small field, unilateral, get back here, um, hip, not the pelvis. So outside MRIs are sometimes sent to us for hip pain. They have a pelvic MRI. It's essentially worthless if we're looking for a really labeled tear. So small field focused on the unilateral hip, not a pelvis MRI. 
uh, MR arthrogram, heard about that. Some more pictures of a labral tear. So here's some arthroscopic pictures. This is where I have the advantage of Dr. Reeder. Um, this is normal. So there's a, a normal little uh, cleft between the labrum and the acetabulum, different than a tear. Femoral head, labrum, acetabulum, and here's some more pictures. So this is from um, this past week, actually. So these are fresh off the press. So this is a labrum, this is a tear, and this is the cartilage damage that happens underneath this impingement, okay? So this is some of what we do. All this red here, this is all synovitis. So it's always very inflamed right around where this active impingement is happening. So we put a spinal needle in, we put a needle through that spinal needle, and then we successfully um, and sequentially dilate this up and put cannulas in. So we want to free this labrum up. There's usually a bump of bone back here, the pincer impingement. We want to take that bump of bone off. Here's the bump of bone. See this right here? Here's the labrum. Here's the edge of the acetabulum behind that tear. Here's some synovitis on the edge of the labrum. So we take a burr and we take this down. That does two things. It gets rid of the bump of bone. It also, I tell people it's like using a rototiller in March, right? It just freshens up the bone for healing purposes right here. And then we're going to put anchors in here right along the edge. We're going to go around and or through the labrum depending on the quality of the labrum. And then we're going to tie that to secure the labrum back onto the acetabulum. So here's some sequential pictures. My PA was like, why are you taking so many pictures? I said, I get to get a, a talk this weekend. So I took a bunch of pictures. So this is an um, anchor going in the bone. Here's the sutures from the anchor. I use different ways to pass sutures. This is just one I was doing it um, for this labrum. It was good quality labrum. So I went through it with this Arthur Pierce. I grab the one that's closest to the labrum. We go through. We grab it on the other side. We pull it up. And we tie knots through the cannulas, push the knots in. And these are a lot of the techniques that, that um, that I use in the shoulder. You know, la re labor repair of the shoulder, very similar to the techniques used for labor repair of the hip, although the hip is a little bit different and a lot uh, steeper learning curve. So this is what it looks like now a secured labrum. Um, you see the cartilage damage underneath, okay? Not as bad as some. Some are full thickness cartilage defects, in which case we'll do some microfracture that you heard earlier. We'll do microfracture of the superior aspect of the acetabulum. So here is a picture of that person's cam. This is where they've been rubbing here. So this is right at the head neck junction. The head is here. The neck comes down this way. We take this off and you see this bony ridge here. It doesn't uh, show as well here, but there's a bony ridge of cam right through here. And we want to take that cam off like this. So here's that same repair. Okay. Here's the, here's the sutures and here's the labor repair. This is now concave. So we've made a convex cam impingement into concave. And this is about at 90 degrees, and that's probably about 50 degrees of flexion. So we can take the, the leg, uh, free it up, and my assistant can move the, the hip around to make sure all areas of conflict or impingement have been taken care of. So we talked about labral repair. Femoroplasty is reshaping the head neck junction. Microfracture if we need it. Labral reconstruction is basically replacing a labrum that's not repairable. Ligamentum teres reconstruction, rarely done. Some people think that there's a role for that in hip instability. Capsular repairs for hip instability, loose body removal. So outpatient, regional and general, um, typically 25% weight bearing, try to get them to walk normally, heel toe gait, but only 25%. Um, and that's anywhere from two to six weeks. Physical therapy is very uh, important, six to 12 weeks. I tell patients, um, you know, they need to have the right expectations. This is a five to six month recovery and patients that have some cartilage damage aren't going to be necessarily pain-free, but they'll be significantly better. So after a couple months, you all oftentimes ask these people, um, are you, how, how's your pain now compared to before? Oh, it's 100% better. Are you normal? No, I'm not normal, but I'm 100% better than I was. So they have, they have to know that up front because these aren't normal hips, they're repaired ones. So a lot of complication potentially, but we do a lot of things to try to minimize our complications. Numbness is the, probably the greatest thing, um, and it's transient. So here's some Philippon facts, 28 NHL players, um, average time to symptoms, 19 months. He says that's longer than he'd like them, but these are NHL players. They're going, 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 going. Um, so significant improvement in their modified Harris hip score, 70 to 95. So it works in high-level people. Um, here's another Philippon study, 34 elite athletes with microfracture. So pretty significant microfracture. 27 of the 34 returned back to elite level. Um, 
this may or may not be significant because these elite athletes, that might be their average anyway. So you have to interpret that um, with some consideration. So earlier surgery, less damage. It kind of go figure, but that's what you find. Time to surgery, if they waited 18 months, those people have a longer rehab time. Um, and minimize cortisone injection in athletes because you take their pain away and they'll just keep destroying it. How old is too old? So there were some earlier studies that showed um, people older than 50 don't do well with hip scopes. This one is older than 50, March of 2014. If they have no significant DJD, tonus grade zero or one, it was found that 55% of these had chondral lesions, but they still had a significant modified Harris hip score. So there are patients that don't have significant arthritis and really minimal to any joint space narrowing. They're older than 50. They have, everything matches up. They have symptomatic impingement. They have CAM. They have pincer. They have a labral tear. Their hip impingement test is positive. And those patients are remarkably um, gratified when you can take their hip pain away to such an extent that maybe previously they were told they just need a hip replacement because they're 55 years old. But they don't have that bad of hip arthritis. So um, the trends, um, this is kind of impressive. Um, this is in arthroscopy, it's, not, um, it's in press, not printed yet. From 2006 to 2013, 25-fold increase in hip arthroscopy. Female, about 59, almost 60%. 1.3% complication rate, some of that is from regional anesthesia. Slight increase in complication rate if they had a lot of steroid injections, okay? Conclusions, listen to the history, symptoms, consider their age, trauma, specific exam to evaluate their condition, judicious use of cortisone injections, consider referral when in doubt, and uh, hip arthroscopy is very successful. Thanks.